Tanakoto, 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 Katoa. Uh, thank you very much for coming, all of you. It's always gratifying to see a, a sea of keen anticipatory faces that are not like stage one students who are having to be there because they have to be there. <laughs> anyway, um, well, I must congratulate the minister. Um, he's taken, I think, about five points from my introduction, <laughs> as, uh, as we've heard. Um, so forgive me if I repeat some of these points along the way. Um, I want to begin, however, by introducing you to one of the victims here in Wellington in 1918. If you want to, you can go to the Karori Cemetery and see uh, his gravestone there. This is Dr. Matthew Holmes. Uh, as you, it's probably too far away for you, but um, he served, as you can see there, uh, he left with the advance party for Samoa in 1914. He served in Gallipoli uh, and in Sinai and in France. So he covered all of the theatres where New Zealand troops were involved in the First World War. Um, he was invalided uh, back to New Zealand in January 1918, and then when the pandemic hit in November, he was one of those GPs who just gave everything to looking after their neighbours and the sick and their patients, uh, got exhausted, caught the flu and died. Um, Matthew Holmes, I think, is one of the hundreds of unsung heroes and heroines from 1918 who unselfishly gave their lives uh, to help fellow New Zealanders. So, to answer the question, well, um, <laughs> the simple answer is, because there's still the risk of another major flu pandemic. Um, we have to remember that mass jet travel has made the world a viral village. Uh, a new pandemic strain, in theory, could be around the world in about 48 hours. And epidemiologists are very well aware of the fact that we had pandemic near misses in 1997 and again in 2009. And we should take comfort from the fact that, you know, we avoided, we dodged the bullet on those occasions. But my main reason for wanting to talk to you tonight is that I believe the lessons from the last big flu pandemic should help us to make better decisions uh, when we cope with the next one. And here's my first point of correction. Um, <laughs> I've suggested there that a repeat of the Spanish flu death rate, again in present day in New Zealand, would see perhaps 30,000 deaths. The minister, however, has told you 38,000. He's probably got better information than I have, so you've got, you've got an authority there. <laughs> anyway, well, just to give you some basic facts at the start, how many people died in this 1918 pandemic? Uh, Jordan, in the 1920s, gave the first proper estimate of around about 21. I think it was 21.3 million. Now, just to put this into perspective, the... First World War is thought to have killed 10 million soldiers, you know, military personnel, and another 7 to 10 million civilians uh, from the disruption of war, uh, the spread of disease and various other things. So, you know, 17 to 20 million died um, from the war. Then for about 50 years, the world seemed to forget about the 1918 flu until Al Crosby's book, Epidemic and Peace, came out in 1976. And that sparked a wave of modern research, because virtually nothing had been written about it since the 1920s. And that wave is still growing. Now, I'm happy to be able to say that New Zealand was early in the field. <laughs> On the left there is my little textbook from 1988, the result of nearly 10 years plodding my way in a lonely vigil through um, the death registers in Lower Hutt, uh, scouring old newspapers. Don't forget, this is before papers passed. It was before the days of laptops, even. Uh, nearly all of it was done by hand on index cards and uh, sheets of paper. And as I confessed to the conference this morning, most of my calculations were not done on a fancy computer, but with a handheld <laughs> calculator. Um, Black November remained... Oh, that's, that was the first one. Then in 2005, Canterbury University Press me to uh, enlarge it. This gave me the chance to produce the book that I really had in my mind's eye in the 1980s um, with uh, new chapters, uh, integrating the narrative with the First World War, um, adding uh, the updated information of the, the fascinating quest for the, um, the virus itself that occurred during the 1980s, um, to add photographs, 
and cartoons that I'd collected back then, and as was mentioned, the, the, the pick of the bunch of the interview material that I'd gathered uh, all those years ago. Black November remains um, the only analysis of a whole country's 1918 flu mortality based on individual death certificates. It's only in the last few years that epidemiologists in North America have been able to use individual death records uh, with really interesting results. So in a way, I suppose I was a pioneer. Uh, quite frankly, I was so young and naive and boneheaded, I didn't realize what I was taking on. <laughs> but once started, you had to get on and finish the job. I suggested in the first edition that, um, uh, well, I'd counted the registered Pākehā uh, deaths, or pandemic-related deaths, of just under 6,500. The registered Māori deaths, and this was a, a, a big increase on the official figures published in 1919, um, I counted uh, 1,679. From newspaper reports, I gathered another reports of another 481, which gave me a, a, a a Maori total of 2,160, and a grand total for the country of just over 8,500. But I was very well aware that there were parts of the country, particularly Waikato and Northland, where Maori deaths went unrecorded and where registration was very low. Jennifer Ann Summers in her PhD work in 2013, examining the influenza pandemic among the New Zealand military, mostly overseas, um, added another 258 that I, well, I hadn't quite missed them. It's just that I'd used a very narrow definition of just influenza pneumonia, and she used a rather broader sort of sickness. Any sickness in November, December was likely to be flu. And so that lifted the New Zealand total to 8,831. But I've now suggested in my latest book uh, that if you allow for those missing Maori deaths in Waikato and Northland, uh, the, the probably as many as 150 to 200. I think we can easily lift it up to about 9,000. Compare that with the total of New Zealand soldiers lost in the First World War, 18,000. So the flu accounted for um, half, the civ in civilian deaths, half the military mortality of World War I. I'm going to involve you now, come on. <laughs> How many does Rice suggest died in the, in the, from the flu? Oh, very good. How many soldiers died? New Zealand soldiers died in World War One. Well, that's great. We're getting on very well here. <laughs> Jolly good. Right. Well, there's the new book already in the bookshops. Nice, cheap, cheap at the price. <laughs> um, a rather depressing Christmas present, however. So I won't recommend that. Um, okay. Um, what I've done is to boil down the narrative, updated it at the end, and added some new sections uh, relating, thanks to Nick Wilson's work. Uh, relating to monuments and memorials, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, and I've aimed it really at a, at a pop general readership and particularly to provide a resource for teachers who teach this, this option uh, in schools. And I think that's a really good thing because it gives schools an opportunity to uh, educate children about the risks of a future public health emergency and, and what are the things to do then. These are some iconic photographs from uh, the 2005 edition. Um, the, the only really, uh, well, there's very little that medicine could do for respiratory illness in 1918. Uh, one thing that had been trialled in the military camps in 1916 and 17 was a 2% zinc sulphate inhalation, an atomised solution. Now, this was, they really didn't know much about viruses in 1918. They suspected they existed. Nobody had ever seen one. That didn't happen until 1933. Uh, but they were well schooled in the germ theory of infection. So they believed bacteria caused all illnesses. Although there were still a lot of GPs who believed that infectious diseases arose from miasma, which is a theory that goes back to the Greeks. Anyway, on the left, you have the, uh, the inhalation apparatus that was first used in Auckland um, early in November. And on the right, Christchurch had improved with a mass, mass production in the bike shed at the back of the old government buildings. Um, the railway workshops had manufactured all the little atomizers and people came in and breathed in uh, and went out again. Unfortunately, what you don't see in the photograph are the queues of people waiting outside who are coughing and sneezing at each other before they come in. So it may not have been the most effective thing. 
Another characteristic of the 1918 pandemic in New Zealand was the use of temporary hospitals. In Auckland and Wellington, um, church halls, schools and other places were used as temporary um, sort of isolation wards for people suffering from influenza. But I've suggested there, some might regard them as havens of peace, but others might regard them as death traps. These were places that were, this is a, a posed photograph at St. Patrick's College in Wellington. Um, probably after the worst of it was over, they've cleaned the floor and everybody's spruced up and standing to attention. Um, the eyewitness descriptions that I've got in my book of conditions in the other, at, at the worst of the pandemic, are, are horrific. Um, nighttime, delirious men struggling to get out and, and go outside, um, people having or spitting thick yellow phlegm all over the floor, people suffering massive nosebleeds, um, young untrained volunteers trying to look after uh, very, very desperately ill people. It was a pretty chaotic situation in some of these temporary hospitals. There is a lighter side to every human disaster, however. <laughs> um, and of course, people wanted um, drinks to replace fluid. Um, and this gave fruiterers throughout New Zealand a wonderful opportunity. Uh, oranges and lemons were in very short supply. And so they bumped the price up. The standard price for an orange or a lemon was about two or th two pence or threepence. And then this fellow's uh, charging nine shillings a dozen and doing very well, <laughs> profiteering from the crisis. Coming back to the international picture, the global picture, uh, how many people died worldwide? Well, again, the minister has already anticipated me on this one and given you some figures. Johnson and Mueller in 2002, a very careful estimate, came up with a round figure of about 50 million. Marian Lopez, writing a couple of years later, estimated uh, around about 60 million. Uh, but rates, death rates vary enormously. They range from Australia's very low 2.6 2 per thousand, and their epidemic, by the way, was in 1919, not like ours in 1918. But at the other extreme, as we heard today from Ryan McLean, um, in Western Samoa, uh, an absolute holocaust, 220 per thousand, that's 22 per cent. That is a fifth of the population of Western Samoa uh, perished in the 1918 flu. Uh, and it was administered by New Zealand at the time. And uh, in 2000, some of you will remember in 2002, Helen Clark issued a, a, a formal apology to Western Samoa for New Zealand administration's shortcomings. Some journalists, however, got a bit carried away and have suggested that there may have been as many as 80 or 100 million deaths from the 1918 flu. I remain to be convinced of those bigger figures. So let's keep it down to around about the 50 to 60 million mark. But even so, bearing in mind the enormous size of the world population at that time, that's still only about two or 3%. So you still had a very good chance of surviving in fact, the vast majority of the New Zealanders who caught it, up to perhaps 40% of the population, recovered, got over it, and got on with their lives. So we shouldn't be too, too panicked by all of this. If you want to go to bed scared tonight, um, have a thought about the Black Death. The Black Death of the 14th century killed a third of Europe's population and half of the population of England. Just think about that. Look, look around the room. Think what the room would look like if the person next to you just disappeared. You know, it's a very sobering thought. <laughs> you can choose which of yours to disappear. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very interesting topic. I, I, I taught medieval history for a while and um, it was still great debate about what caused it. Was it bubonic plague or pneumonic plague? Because doctors at the time insisted that it was person to person droplet infection. And just recently you might have read in the newspapers, uh, uh, as well as the fleas from the rats, the suggestion that human, human lice might have, might have spread the disease. That's the world's worst recorded pandemic, although the plague of Justinian might have run at a close second. But the influenza pandemic uh, chases it as a, as a pretty close second. There was a great surge of medical scholarship on influenza after 1987 when Jeffrey Taubenberger and his team reconstructed the, um, the genome, the genetic structure of the A H1N1 virus of 1918 from the preserved lung tissue of a soldier who had died in hospital. Since then, there have been over 900 
articles in medical and scientific journals um, mentioning the 1918 influenza pandemic. Uh, in fact, the total of um, uh, articles about influenza, the virus, since that date uh, is up around about the 3,000 mark, and I can't pretend to have read all of those. Howard Phillips, who was uh, the great authority on the influenza in South Africa, in an article in 2014, had counted 50 books and theses and 200 historical or social science articles about the 1918 flu appearing since 2004. And he added seven television documentaries. And for those of you who enjoyed Downton Abbey, you must remember you know, that the flu was a key element uh, in the plot in that uh, television program. The latest global survey, for you to rush away and order on Google or on Amazon, <laughs> is um, Laura Spinney's book, Pale Rider. It's an odd title. It refers to a novel written by Catherine Ann Porter, Pale Horse, Pale Rider, about set in, in America in the 1918 flu. Um, I met Laura at uh, the conference in Madrid, where I was in, in last November, and uh, uh, she describes it as a protean event, an event with extremely diverse outcomes. One could almost say that the flu was like a hydra, many different heads. It looked different in different places. She argues that the uh, First World War is critical to understanding the impact of the flu. The fact that large numbers of troops were moving around the globe, um, well over a million American soldiers moved across the North Atlantic during 1918 uh, to the Western Front, and thousands of wounded soldiers were, and sick soldiers went back home. So uh, trains and steamships ensured a very rapid global diffusion. She also argues rather more controversially that the influenza affected the outcome of the First World War, that if the German spring offensive early in 1918 had succeeded in getting, it almost got to Paris, um, the Allies might well have been forced to come to a truce rather than for Germany to suffer what was effectively a, a complete military defeat. The fact was, both sides of the, great, of, the, um, of the Western Front had the influenza. Lots and lots of soldiers, very sick, too sick to fight. And Ludendorff himself said that that was the reason the spring offensive failed. There was just so much sickness in the German army. Um, as the Americans uh, poured in with their reinforcements, of course, uh, they caught the flu as well. Uh, so the middle months that summer, the severe, sorry, the severe autumn wave of the uh, pandemic affected both sides in the First World War. Was it a freak of nature? Well, it was certainly a very bizarre influenza pandemic by any measure. Normally influenza, seasonal influenza appears in the Northern Hemisphere, and then six months later, appears in the same virus or strain that will appear in the southern hemisphere. The severe second wave in late 1918 occurred simultaneously in northern and southern hemispheres. That just defies all the usual um, logic and, and no, received knowledge about the diffusion of influenza. London, England and Auckland, New Zealand had their peak of deaths in the same week so it just it sort of defies normal diffusion patterns. Most influenza, even today, kills mostly the very young and vulnerable or the very elderly. Um, and the curve is a sort of a big U. But this was an unusual one. Uh, in some countries, particularly in North America, the elderly were spared. Um, but in most countries, and New Zealand, is not, it was a W. So you had a peak of, of very young, but then uh, a trough for uh, teenagers, then a peak of young adults, and then another trough, and then a lot uh, of the elderly dying. Young adults, 25 to 45, were most at risk, and men twice as at much at risk in New Zealand uh, as women in that age group. In New Zealand, males died at double the rate of females in that young adult age group. We don't quite know why. This is the bar graph. Uh, from Black November, showing the, uh, the age-specific death rates. And you can see that the male deaths are, are almost double the female. But notice very high peaks on the, uh, el the, over the elderly on the right. There was a great deal of diversity in New Zealand during the, the outbreak of the flu. Some places had very low death rates, 
Towns like Nelson, uh, Timaru and Westport got off very lightly. Other smaller places had very high death rates. Inglewood, Taumrenui, and Nightcaps in Southland, a little coal mining town, um, a small population, but uh, it suffered something like 90% morbidity, so that all the adults were down and ill at the same time. There was a delay in relief coming up from Otata, and it finished up with a death rate that was very similar to Maori communities in the North Island. Um, Wellington had nearly doubled the death rate of Christchurch. Uh, it begs the question, you know, why such diversity? They were similar sized cities uh, in 1918. But I've addressed that in, in another paper and an article, which I'm hoping to get published soon. Maori died at seven or eight times the Pākehā death rate. And again, um, I'm working on a paper to try to explain that particular question. Here's a Turnbull uh, photograph of a Maori burial, probably the early 1900s, um, a child being buried. A reminder that things were not at all normal during 1918. We don't have any photographs of, of Maori burials or situation in Maori communities. People were just too busy uh, trying to get over the flu. The fact that this is, uh, uh, you know, a very orderly uh, burial suggests that it was certainly not from the pandemic. Um, Maori deaths uh, in Northland, for example, um, so many dying at the same time, there was no chance of uh, holding tangi. The tangi was in fact banned by the government to prevent people moving around and spreading infection. Um, in many cases in Northland, uh, pits were dug and bodies were laid out side by side before being covered up so that there are no marked graves but just depressions in the ground that are still tapu. And that's very similar to the situation in, in Western Samoa. Recent research suggests that the variations in death rates were probably caused by patchy patterns of immunity from the mild herald wave uh, in the middle of 1918. Uh, early to mid-1918, most countries around the world reported uh, heightened influenza, um, a paradise for doctors, lots of people sick, not many dying. <laughs> so lots of fees, but not too many bodies. Um, it was noticed in these early herald outbreaks that people with pre-existing medical conditions especially men suffering from tuberculosis, were very much at risk of death. Um, it's possible that more remote Maori communities uh, missed the smiled first wave, but many Maori lived in close proximity to European towns, uh, and we would, we would expect them to have been pretty much as much exposed uh, to passing viruses as others. But research on the, um, in the military, Dennis Shanks's work, uh, has demonstrated very conclusively that um, people coming from remote areas into the military um, recently arrived uh, didn't seem to have the same resistance to secondary bacterial infections like pneumonia. And that may apply also to some of the remote Maori communities. They also had poor standards of nutrition and housing uh, and sanitation. They were a highly vulnerable population at that time. Maori had very high rates of tuberculosis, of other respiratory diseases, and also widespread tobacco smoking. So their lungs were probably already damaged. And that's another possible explanation for the, um, in the l higher death rates among males, because smoking was such a prevalent activity uh, in the male population at that time. This is what some of the bodies, some of the patients looked like before they died. And this is a very easy question to answer. Why did the bodies turn black? Um, this is a condition known medically as cyanosis. Um, and it's often a consequence of severe uh, loba pneumonia. Um, as uh, inflammation uh, destroys the epithelium of the lungs, the lungs fill with blood and fluid from uh, broken cells. And this reduces, sharply reduces the amount of oxygen being exchanged into the blood. And as that is reduced, uh, the skin turns a dusky sort of purple, often starting with the lips and ears. Uh, one of the puzzles about the 1918 flu now has a reasonably coherent explanation. And in the audience at the back tonight, Dennis Shanks uh, is one of those responsible for this. And it's interesting that they came to, he and Den, uh, John Brundage came to this conclusion and it was confirmed uh, within a year by work done in uh, North America by Gagnon and others. They noted that the peak age of death of many of the victims in North America was about was 28 years. 
But if you count back, that takes you back to a birth cohort of 1890, which means that they were born during the previous big pandemic, the Russian flu of 1889 to 92. It was a different virus, however. And the argument is, the hypothesis, is that early life exposure to this virus damaged the T cells in the immune system. And then when those immune systems encountered a completely different virus in 1918, this triggered a cytokine storm reaction, an overreaction. And this fits the eyewitness evidence in New Zealand because it often wasn't the thin, weedy, chesty types who went down with it. It was the big, robust farming types, uh, you know, big, strong working men uh, who were most prone to dying. It's a very plausible and satisfying uh, solution to that problem. Well, the second part of the lecture is really about uh, looking to the future. How well will we cope with the future influenza pandemic? We have a lot of things going for us now that they didn't have in 1918. We have early warning. The in global influenza surveillance and warning systems are very well developed and very efficient. On the other hand, um, our annual flu, our seasonal flu vaccines probably won't cover a completely new virus. And some people say, well, that's all right. We've got antiviral drugs now, you know, Tamiflu and things like that. Problem is, of course, you need to take them very quickly or early. Uh, and many people with influenza um, uh, have the virus and are shedding virus before they show any symptoms. And it's a bit tricky to get those sorts of drugs administered very quickly. People will say, well, you know, they died from pneumonia in 1918. Now we've got antibiotics. Jolly good. But we also now have resistance to certain antibiotic strains. Um, would we have enough stocks of uh, antibiotics? Who will administer them? What about the problem of people who are allergic to penicillin, for example? You know, there are all sorts of complications. Uh, in, uh, there's no simple answer to uh, dealing with a future pandemic. One big lesson from 1918 that is that we can expect many people to get sick all at once. Hospitals are likely to be overwhelmed as they were in 1918. And you have to remember that among those afflicted will be the medical staff. Doctors and nurses will be among those who come down with the flu and are not there to do their jobs. Um, some people say, well, we have marvelous technology now for saving people who are seriously ill. But you know, the equipment in uh, A&E or ICUs, uh, who decides who gets that life-saving equipment? Um, is it the politicians? Should they be saved first? Uh, I won't go down that track, but the minister has departed. So I'm safe. <laughs> but, you know, there are all sorts of ethical problems about who gets the treatment early on. Even your normal neighbourhood medical centre may not be functioning properly if the receptionist is down with the flu, if half of the doctors are down with the flu. Public transport is likely to be seriously disrupted, as it was in 1918, and people dealing with the public uh, people like taxi drivers and also ambulance drivers uh, are also likely to be among the early victims. The point to grasp is that a pandemic is a rather different sort of emergency from a flood or an earthquake or an impact disaster. If the pandemic persists over several weeks, we can expect food shortages. Uh, if all the truck drivers go down, you know, who's going to bring all the supplies of food to the supermarkets? Essential services like rubbish collection probably be halted. And one of the unexpected problems in 1918, which we have to face again, would have to face again, is that people can't go straight back to work. There's a long convalescence period. So people with bad flu need a week or two to get over it. And they need to be fed. Um, in 1918, of course, they set up soup kitchens. It was a tremendous community response. The important message, I think, is that we need to plan for it now, to be prepared both in our own households and in communities you know, to have stocks of paracetamol and things like that on hand. In some parts of the world, wearing of masks was made compulsory. You got fined if you went on the street without a mask. Uh, in Japan, that the use of masks has remained ever since. So you'll see numbers of Japanese tourists with face masks on. That means they've got a cold. And they don't want to spread it uh, to other people. The best advice if you get the flu in a future pandemic or even any season is to go home, go to bed and stay there. Take plenty of fluids because you'll probably be sweating a lot with the high fever. 
Take some painkillers, but not too much aspirin. That damages the stomach linings. But in 1918, aspirin was a sort of wonder drug because it was the one that, that controlled fever and relieved pain. Pneumonia is the biggest danger. How many people in the general population could recognize the signs of pneumonia if they had it themselves or if their loved ones were getting it? The initial shivering fit, this is straight out of the nursing textbook, bodily stiffness, stabbing pains in the chest, shallow, irregular breathing, extreme prostration, you just can't stand up, high fever, dry cough, blood streaked sputum. How do you treat bacterial pneumonia without antibiotics? Remember that viral pneumonia has to run its course anyway. And in some cases, some of the victims in 1918 probably got the virus straight into their lungs and didn't really have much of a chance. The key to survival is good nursing. Stay in bed, but you, you need someone to look after you, to bring you drinks, to sponge you, to reduce the fever, those sorts of things, a family member or a friend or a neighbor. I think we probably need um, more public education uh, ads on TV with practical advice on home nursing, rather like those civil defense earthquake ads which proved their worth during the Christchurch earthquake in 2011. Remember though that New Zealand has changed a bit. Um, in the first, the 1918 pandemic hit New Zealand at the end of the First World War. Uh, we'd had four years of conditioning or brainwashing uh, about patriotic duty. There's Kitchener on the left, you know, your country needs you, but I much, I rather like that American poster on the right, hold up your end, you know, and so many people dragged off on stretches uh, during the flu. Patriotic committees in 1918 who'd been pushing the war effort quite often turned into the epidemic committees. And people had been brainwashed about duty and sacrifice. So neighbors were willing to risk their lives to help neighbors in need. But we have to remember, and you don't need a historian to tell you this, New Zealand society has changed dramatically since 1918. It's a very different place. Would we cope as well today? That's debatable. Communications are certainly better. We have a lot of technology now, texting, emails, Facebook, Twitter. And the first thing you should do, of course, is to let family and friends know when you're sick so that they might come and look after you. There are big problems in dealing with a pandemic and preparedness, as we heard from some of the papers this afternoon. Stockpiling antibiotics is a very expensive business. Some of them have very short shelf life. So government and health boards need to consider uh, cost effective alternatives, perhaps increasing the pneumococcal vaccination rates for adults, uh, since it was the pneumonia that killed people rather than the influenza, improving housing to reduce overcrowding, I'm glad the minister touched on these sorts of issues. Um, setting up special helplines where people can get advice on how to help or cope with severe cases. And one overall factor, of course, is to reduce poverty um, because it was the households in 1918 of poor working class people. Relief workers found that they had no reserves. They had no food in the cupboard. Some of them had no blankets. They just had sacks on the bed. You know, improving people's standard of living uh, is one good preparation. Finally, um, comment on the memorials. New Zealand has hundreds of war memorials, um, as we heard this afternoon, proportionately far more about the Boer War than any other subsequent war, but we have no national memorial to the influenza pandemic. And this is why I'm sorry the minister has already left, but I have sent him a letter about this. Um, you know, if you accept that we had 9,000, um, mostly civilians, but also many doctors and nurses dying in this thing, uh, I think we need to take note of it and remind future generations about it. The public needs reminders uh, to be educated about 1918. And I think it would be appropriate for schools to teach uh, disaster response. Uh, this is one of those memorials, the statue to Dr. Margaret Cruikshank in Waimati in South Canterbury. She was the first woman uh, to enter general practice in New Zealand. She was a much beloved GP. She worked herself to exhaustion um, and caught the flu and died uh, and is still revered by and remembered by her local community. I think two big lessons finally to draw from the 1918 experience, self-reliance and prompt response. Don't wait for help to come. Be self-reliant and proactive. Organize your neighborhood, share your supplies, get volunteers. And when sickness strikes, 
uh, it's a bit like the Air New Zealand uh, safety message, you know, put your own mask on first and then deal with others. Look after your own family first and then check on the neighbours. And we all need to revive neighbourhood watch groups. Get to know your neighbours. You may not like them very much, but they might save your life. You never know. And here's some cheerful general info. <laughs> Keep calm. Don't panic. Don't panic. Don't panic. And carry on. Let's hope it's only flu because we've got good ways of dealing with that. But it might be something different. It might be a different pathogen, something like SARS or Ebola, something very nasty that we haven't heard of yet. And we should keep smiling, however rotten you feel. Um, be nice to those caring for you. So, prompt response. Towns in 1918 that organised early and well kept their death rates low. But I think another important message is that the Ministry of Health needs a critical mass of expertise to ensure an effective prompt response to a crisis. And we need effective surveillance systems to guide that response. And I'm pleased, we were very pleased to hear this afternoon from the Ministry um, that uh, we not only have a very good pandemic plan, but it is regularly exercised. And there's one uh, in, in progress this year, Exercise Pomare, uh, to test and uh, train up yet more people in how to deal with these things. We need flexibility to cope with different infectious diseases. So finally, to sum up, the 1918 flu was the highest mortality natural disaster in New Zealand history. And it could happen again, if not from influenza, then from some entirely new pathogen. And preparing for such an event uh, has very widespread benefits beyond biosecurity. It helps to strengthen communities, makes government agencies more flexible and responsive, and supports a strong national public health capacity, which will benefit other areas of population health. Thank you very much.